Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. The truth is really interesting. We're going to go into a discussion that happened over 150 years ago. It's still going on today because um, science has never settled. I know. <laughs> There's always a discussion. Now, what's, what's interesting, Etienne de Harvin, the, the medical doctor, virus mania is a social disease in our highly developed society. To cure it will require conquering fear, fear being the most deadly contagious virus, most effect efficiently transmitted by the media. To err is human, but, but to preserve it is diabolic. This is, now Tina Harvin wrote many, many books, okay? Um, well, one of them in particular was um, against AIDS, that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. And, of course, an AIDS denialist now in our culture is, is dangerous. But these two guys I want, you're, we're going to get into. Pasteur is on the left, and uh, Bichamp, Bichamp is on the right. Now, they had different theories about how diseases would occur in the body. Now, figure in the 1800s, they're just coming up with these, these microscopes, and they can start to see certain diseases. Well, it's interesting because looking at this, Pasteur and, and Beecham, which one was right? Or were they both a little bit right? Okay, so that, now, now this is going to challenge belief systems because has anyone in here ever taken microbiology? Okay, yeah, it was really fun. You learn viruses, you saw pictures of viruses, everything else. None of those pictures were right. <laughs> they were all composites, okay? They were ideas. And what you're going to find out, and I did the same thing. I'm looking, you know, in all the research that I do for this stuff, we're looking at DNA viruses, RNA viruses, you know, and then all this stuff that's written down, and you think that this stuff it has, has a scientific backing. Well, prepare to have your belief system challenged. Now, I'm going to have a huge amount of comments that are going to want to crucify me because there is a religion to science. For, so let's look. There is a religion to science. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. It requires a belief system. But, you know, I would call it a hypothesis. Now, a virus lacks the ability to replicate on its own. A virus needs a host cell duplicating equipment, barring enzymes and other moleculars to concoct more viruses. It is not a living organism. It's simply a well-organized molecular parasite. Fabio Marrero, um, Institute of Human Virology. So it's not a living organism, can't reproduce on itself, um, and it's almost impossible to see without an electron microscope. And electron microscopes are, are, were literally developed in the 30s. But have we, do we see a real viral isolate? You know, of course, you know, in the medical world, you would say yes. 45% of your DNA is viral. Viral. Okay, so how does that work? Um, <laughs> I love this. The double strand of DNA is a little virus hotel. Um, viruses are responsible for two critically important functions in na nature. Variation and adaptation. Yes, the virus is behind much of what we termed evolution. Many viruses can change in response to alterations in their environment, sort of like a chameleon. So what's the purpose of this? So we have a virus coming into a cell. Okay, now it's not alive, but it does have a certain protein effect, according to these experts. Now, it's supposed to get into the cell, um, communicating possibly from the outside world, but it's literally changing how that cell works. Now, cells have, you know, a cell wall, a bunch of organelles in there, and the, their job is to produce proteins. Now, how they produce it is based on the stimulus of the environment. So if that cell um, is stimulated by a pathogen, it can produce proteins that will produce cancer. If it's stimulated by something else, it can stimulate proteins that reverse cancer. So the job of a cell is just to take in nutrients and produce proteins based on the stimulus of the environment. 
So viruses are communicating to that cell. 45% of your DNA is viral. Now, viruses are vital for our ecosystem. They are able to move genetic information between different hosts, but we still don't fully understand how this is influenced and continues to influence the evolution of our new species. That means that if I sneeze on you or transfer a virus, which I just did, okay, it's going to get on you. And if it needs to reproduce or has the opportunity to reproduce, we're not quite sure, but it gets into the, the DNA, produces proteins, and then you give it to you, and then you give it to you, and then you give it to you. So it's utilizing your enzymes, your material to reproduce itself. Now, do you think utilizing that material might change the constituents of it? Yeah. So now viruses, it, it, does anyone ever hear about the cold or flu season? Okay, great advertising, great advertising. Okay, there is no cold or flu season. You have influenza on you all the time. You've got viruses on you all the time, and it only has to do with a weakened immune system. Or does it? Now, the presence of an organism doesn't mean it causes illness. So, so how does this work? Well, let's look at, at the science way back when, because we're going to do another talk like this. Hopefully next week I'll have a chance to do it. But I want you to see how Pasteur was almost um, kicked out of France, okay, for wiping out the silk industry and wiping out the dairy industry, okay? And then, but we're going to go over and how you can't criticize him now. But let's look at uh, bacteriologists. Now, we're looking in the mid-1800s, and they're looking at these diseases that are caused. And they just have this new invention of the microscope. And they're looking for animals or people that have died of a certain disease. And he developed a postulate to find out if these, the, the, the bugs that he was finding, the germs that he was finding, or microbes that you could find, that talk about, um, were the causative factor. Now, he discovered wound infections, you know, certain bacteria in there, tuberculosis, conjunctivus, cholera, a number of other diseases. And he developed certain postulates that have to be enacted to make sure that that pathogen was causing the disease. And first, you got to find the same bug, okay, microbe, in every case. Does that make sense? Okay, it would to me too. Okay, then you have to isolate that. So first, you got to find the bug, and then you have to make it separate. Now, I just told you viruses can't be isolated. They have to grow in, in, in host tissue. Viruses can't be isolated. They have to grow in host tissue. But now for a bacteria, you can isolate it, okay? Because these things grow in certain growth mediums, so you can separate it out. Now, once you identify a consistent pattern of disease, because if everybody in the front row had a cold, coughing, sneezing, is it all from the same pathogen? Could be, might not be, maybe, I don't know. Okay, so you got to find out. If, if everybody walks through a swamp and we're all bitten by a mosquito uh, containing malaria, do we all get malaria? No. No. So it's not really the pathogen that causes this. And so when we're looking at Robert Koch, um, it has to be in every host, and then you grow it, you infect a host with it, a healthy host, you have to cause the disease, okay? And then when you cause the disease, then you can isolate it again. So we have a certain parameters for bacterial infections, okay, and that you can identify it. The problem is a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of the things that you're looking at today, like human papillomavirus causing cervical cancer, that's never gone through Koch's postulate. You're, you're looking at hepatitis, that's never gone through Koch's postulates. So there's a lot of um, diseases today that have not gone through the old theory of identifying the pathogen, uh, infecting a healthy host, and then causing the problem. Do you know why? I just said healthy host. So a lot of hosts can get infected, so you have to weaken their immune system. Now Theobald Smith, and again, we're going back to the mid-1800s, late-1800s, 
He developed an idea. Now this is microbes because you just start to identify these. They're just starting to find out that they're in certain diseases. And he develops a, a formula for the germ theory. Now germ theory, so that means it's not actual fact, it's a hypothesis, something that works. Now you get the virulence of the pathogen times the number of pathogens times the opening size over the resistance of host. That resistance of host is the immune system. And this is different because you can't really measure it. You can't measure the actual immune system. The greatest immunologist on the planet can't measure it. There's no parameters. So how would you measure an immune system? A fever response? Possibly, okay. Because if for every one degree increase in temperature, the speed of the immune system doubles. Um, but it's really the resistance of host, this, this immune system aspect. Now we can go way back to 1968 where they're saying, look, this germ theory has been used as dogma. Uh, it neglects many of the other factors that play a part to play in the host germ environment complex. And it's crazy because Pasteur was claiming that, that it's the germ that causes the disease. If you look at every medical doctor today, or not, not the, the smart ones. I'm talking the ones that are promoting the vaccines. You know, you know, you got to get that tetanus shot. And, and in fact, it was kind of fun because one of our patients, I mean, this guy is brilliant. He's head Hare Krishna um, a, a priest for, for all of Southern California. He's a mixed martial artist. This guy is one of the coolest guys you ever want to meet. I mean, he's just fun to hang out with. Okay, so he's a vegetarian. He's washing dishes. He cuts his hands while he's washing dishes on a sharp knife. Okay, now tetanus is a disease of sick farm animals. It's an anaerobic bacterium. It has to be buried in there. And so he calls me up when he's at the emergency room and the doctor wants to give him a tetanus shot. And I said, buddy, there's no way it's not possible to have any type of exposure in your environment, in the sink, right there, washing it, not possible. So, he's a mixed martial artist. He's head. He's got, I think, six kids now. Okay. Do you think he's quiet or do you think he's a little on the bold side? So, he's got me on the cell phone. He's got the medical doctor there in the emergency room. Hey, my chiropractor's on the phone. He says there's no way I could have tetanus. Okay. You know what the doc said? He's right. It's just our protocol. You couldn't possibly have it. We just have to give it to you. <laughs> okay, so, so we have to look at this. So there are other factors than just being exposed to the germ. Okay, now, uh, the, the British Medical Journal, uh, Biomedical Model of Illness. Again, this is working on the germ theory that germs cause disease. Do they cause disease or would you have to have a weakened immune system in order to accept it? Now, um, this guy, brilliant, won, a, won the uh, Nobel Prize. And he's talking about, because what is a virus? It's going to be a little bit of a protein because it's incorporated into the DNA. The DNA is just a collection of amino acids in a really cool form. We are so constituted that we can never receive other proteins into the blood than those that have been modified by digestive juices. Every time an alien protein penetrates by a fraction, the organization, or organism suffers and becomes resistant. Now, this was 1913. They had just a few vaccines back then. But this is what he's talking about. When you inject something or expose to a foreign protein, the body can mount a defense. Digestion does, does temper it. And here, Rudolf Virchow. And again, these guys are looking at all of these, they're just discovering. And we've lost that discovery in science. We have these people that are doing dogma. They're repeating it over and over again. This is safe and effective. This causes a disease. We're not going to look at the immune system response or the stressors of the person. You know, you have a common cold, let's give you an antibiotic, even though we have antibiotic resistant bacteria. We must wipe down all of the hospitals and all of the schools with anti-infectious agents, even though we're creating super bacteria. Why? Because we're practicing dogma. We don't know anything else to do. I mean, the psychosis and 
And Virchow, if I could live my life over again, I would devote it to proving that germs seek their natural habitat of diseased tissue rather than being the cause of disease. And, and this was interesting because we would talk about this in, in, you know, in between classes, you're around with your professors. Yes, you do have a Cuban cigar and you're discussing life and health and how physiology works, which is like the greatest way to teach. Okay, by the way, okay, it really is. And so flies don't cause garbage. And, and you might say, because the modern theory of disease, if you see a dead animal with maggots growing out of it, you can say, woof, maggot infectious syndrome. It was the maggots that killed that animal. And you, no, that's not. No, these things develop afterwards, okay? So I'm reading this article, and this is a, a pretty recent article out of the International Journal of Vaccines and Vaccination. Vaccines and Vaccination. Now this is, they're probably pro-vaccine. Okay, just guess it. Okay, so um, who had their finger on the magic of life? Antoine Beauchamp or Pasteur? And, and I've got to read this. So it's with Beauchamp. He had the profound voice of his science. Oh no, had the profound voice of his science not been silenced, much of humankind may have been spared the worst aspects of infectious and vital stresses of the 20th century. Since the case can be made that the approved and improper dangerous treatment of infectious diseases over the last century has in large part been given right to the present epidemic wave of degenerative diseases, including cancer, AIDS, Ebola, we might have been spared these miseries as well. At least we would have understood much more clearly why we have them. Fortunately, however, Beauchamp's work has been kept alive by a small successive bands of truth seekers. Oh my gosh. So if it's only the germ we gotta be concerned with, we don't have to ask the person that's getting the vaccine, how do you sleep? How do you eat? What kind of medications are you taking? No, dude, it's just the germs. Just do the therapy, okay? And if you're doing a therapy that may have another effect on the immune system that they're not quite sure how the immune system works, you're not gonna even look at those effects. Hell, you're even gonna call them side effects. <laughs> okay, so when we look at this, the legend has it that, that on Pasteur's deathbed, I, he was wrong. You made a noise and I thought it went out again. On, on Pasteur's deathbed, it's, it's, it may be urban legend or he really did it. He said, it's not the, the microbe, it's the terrain. So it is. And so this answers that question. If we're all walking through a malaria-filled swamp, that if we all get bit by a mosquito, are we all going to get a disease? No. And now Bo, uh, Beauchamp was saying treat the patient, not the infection. So this means we can all have the same infection or the same exposure, but the, the, the way the body is going to respond to it is going to be totally different. So we have two great... Um, comparisons of the germ theory by Pasteur and really Beauchamp. And disease arises from microorganisms within the cells of the body. So this means that you have physical, chemical, or emotional stressors, certain type of stressors or exposures that's going to weaken you and predispose you to disease. And I love this number five. Every disease is associated with a particular microorganism, whereas Beauchamp is Every disease is associated with a particular condition. So symptoms, symptoms. Now, now it's interesting because this is uh, MedCrave Online and the adoption. Okay, wait, wait. Oh, I love this one. There is no medical doctrine as potentially dangerous as partial truth implemented as the whole truth. Any medical profession, bioscientist, healthcare practitioner, or a lay person for that matter, who wishes to gain insight into the origins and nature of infectious and chronic dis illness against the backdrop of a marvelous view of the life process must consider Beauchamp. 60% of our adult population have a chronic critical illness in America that they will never recover from. 40% have more than one. 54% of our children have a chronic critical illness that they will never recover from. This is over half of our population is sick with a chronic critical illness. And we should look 
at not the pathogen, but how the host is living. Uh, now, the Beauchamp explained, now think of this, this is 150 years ago. The microzyma is at the beginning and end of all organization. It's the fundamental, fundamental anatomical element whereby the cells and the tissues, the organs, and the whole organism are constituted. He for, referred to this microzymas as the builders and destroyers of cells. He always found microzymas remaining after the complete de decomposition of a dead organism and concluded that they were not only transitory and biological elements. What they're looking at is they're saying there's, there's some kind of microzymas. We could call it microflora or normal flora or gut flora. How important is that now at the cutting edge of science? We're looking at fecal transplants that help dementia and autism. We have such an intimate relationship with bacteria and viruses, certain pathogens. There's, you can see MS corrected by certain parasitic infections. There's, there's a lot of doctors out there building certain parasites, and we're talking porcine parasites, and giving it to certain kids with, with autism or brain damage, and it's helping them. So we're actually adding microbes into the body. And just in the last few years, we're starting to see antibiotic resistant this, antibiotic resistant that. And so what does stupid Pastorians do? Okay, they develop stronger and stronger antibiotics to kill it. And the, the nature continues to grow when we're living in actual harmony of this. In addition, they carry out vital functions of decomposition. They're the precursors of beings, bacteria, yeast, fungus, which, which do so. Thus, he clearly presents the idea that the physical life of the higher biologic forms arise and is dependent upon and is recycled by microscopic beings. Simple, immediate proof of dependence is the indispensable bacteria population of the human gut, 150 years ago. Now, when I'm watching this, okay, we're reading this stuff, I'm getting goosebumps because I'm thinking, God, this is nerding out 101. <laughs> okay, so then I come across a biologist. He's actually a, a, vac um, a virologist. So now he studies viruses. He studies this. And in fact, he's the discoverer of a megavirus uh, in the ocean. So this guy is really sharp. And he comes up and he's going on the Beauchamp idea. Um, and, and, you know, that viruses really aren't alive. And they've never been proven to cause a disease. So he picks on one. He picks on um, measles. Okay, measles is pretty popular, right? Okay, yeah, why not? Because it's good advertising. Okay, so he offers 100,000 euros to anybody that can prove that measles, and this is still open, by the way, that the measles virus exists and causes measles. 100,000. Okay, and this is in the news. This is everywhere. You know, our kids are getting two doses of the measles vaccine, two to be three, soon to be three, because the first one didn't work. And then they found out, well, you know, we probably need a booster. Now the booster doesn't work. So now they're going to get a third one. Pretty soon they'll have them annually. You know, we'll do, we'll do something weird. But um, now he, this guy wins in court. He actually lost because this medical student um, presented six papers that supposedly had proved the, that measles virus existed. Mm. Except when you look at the details, they didn't really prove anything. The federal Supreme Court ruled that the measles virus trial, the first civil Senate of the federal Supreme Court, has confirmed the judgment of the higher court rulings of Stuttgart, blah, 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 um, which had offered as a reward of scientific proof of the existence of the alleged measles virus does not have to be paid to the plaintiff. The plaintiff also has to bear the procedural cost. Five experts involved in the case presented with the results of scientific studies. All five experts, including Professor uh, Dr. Andreas Podolinski. <laughs> hey, look, I've been working since 445. Does anybody think you could pronounce this better or faster than I could? There's got to be. Okay, thank God. Good. Oh, man. Okay, okay, fake it, okay, there you go, there you go, Podolinsky, oh my god, okay, here, let's try this again, come on, baby, come on, Papa needs a new pair of shoes, 
Good, that's working. Okay, P O D B E I E L S K I. Podolinsky. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Um, uh, appointed by the Stuttgart court proceedings, have consistently found that none of the six publications which have been introduced to the trial contain scientific proof of the existence of the alleged measles virus. None of the six publications. Now, two recognized laboratories, including the world's largest and genetic institute, arrived at exactly the same results independently. The results prove that the authors of the six publications in the measles virus case were wrong. And the direct result of all measles virologists are still wrong today. They have misinterpreted ordinary constituents of cells as a part of suspected measles viruses. With the results of the genetic test, all uh, thesis of existence of the measles virus has been scientifically disproved. Why will this not be in the American media and not be in the court cases? Because it's hard to develop a massive panic, okay, where nobody died, okay, and there used to be 4 million cases a year. 4 million! Not 1,200 in eight months. We're talking 4 million cases a year, okay, out of that, 400 died, and that's bad. But in using Beauchamp's idea, we would look at those 400 and look at their terrain. Did they have a secondary problems? Did they have um, colds, flus, weakened immune system, nutrient deficiency? We already know vitamin A can negatively affect um, your body's ability to mount an immune system response. First, it appeared that Dr. Lanka lost, but he took it to a higher court, um, were more experts in two independent laboratories. It turned out that the proof provided was a composite of several different electron microscopic images. And the composite involved different components of damaged cells. The composite could not be duplicated. The German Federal Supreme Court confirmed that there was not enough evidence to prove the existence of the measles virus. So now, do you think that the medical world is going to take this lying down when the courts actually prove uh, no. So this is what they're doing. Okay, so I just showed you the court documents and what happened. This is what the media is putting out there. Um, disappointing outcome. Bardens versus Lanka. Measles proven to exist, but anti-vaxxer Lanka keeps his money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's an anti-vaxxer. That string him up. Okay, it seems after three years of struggle in a court has reached its end point. Extreme anti-vaxxer Stefan Lanka, okay, yeah, right, okay, who denied the existence of harmful viruses. I mean, look at that one statement. You know, harmful viruses, okay, two labs couldn't even find it. Um, <laughs> the young Dr. Bardens provided Lanka with, so we have the evil anti-vaxxer. And the young doctor, oh, God, I love, I mean, I'm reading this and I go, God, I got to present this in a talk. Okay, show the evidence, denied the evidence, met his criteria. Okay, Lanka denied. He didn't personally say, look, I think it's bullet. Okay, two labs confirmed it, five doctors. Okay, so what really happened in court? Um, even though the existence of the measles virus could be concluded from the summary of the six papers, could be concluded, none of the authors had conducted any controlled experiments in according with internationally defined rules and principles of good scientific practice. Professor Podolinsky um, considered the lack of controlled experiments explicitly has methodologic weaknesses of these publications, uh, which are, after all, the relevant studies on the subject. No other publications trying to attempt to prove the existence of the measles virus. Furthermore, at the trial, it was noted that contrary to the legal limit, blah, 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 the Robert Koch Institute, the highest German authority in the field of infectious diseases, has failed to perform tests for the alleged measles virus and to publish these. The Robert Koch Institute claims that it has made internal studies on the measles virus, however, refuses to hand them over or publish the results. No, of course we've looked at it. Yes. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> it must be there. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, if, if, so if I told you this, and this, is, this was challenging my belief system, because I'm looking at the pro, I'm looking at the anti, I'm looking at, at the challenging stuff, 
and I come across the, the, the this. <laughs> okay, now, um, how is a virus identified? Okay, uh, the, the CDC guesses which DNA fragments are associated with which type of virus. So you're looking at this lecture in a microscope, you're seeing little shapes of protein, and you say, yeah, that's probably it, I don't know, maybe. However, this key person got his corresponding conclusion and how exactly that person proved it, even the experts don't really know, hardly anyone questions it. Okay, it's, that's not a miracle because vaccination experts and virologists that question this, they question their right of existence simultaneously in their career. So currently, you cannot even question how did they find it? How did they look at it? Now, what about AIDS? This was an article in the British Medical Journal about a comment about um, two guys. They're talking about uh, Stefan Lenka. Virologist Stefan Lenka believes that viruses which are claimed to be very dangerous do not in fact exist at all. As a source for his evidence, um, I do not find it quite ironic that a mere public display of flag ignorance. Okay. Flegg is, is not a virologist. Lanka does not lazily accept our dominant fashionable virological paradigms has been in a flag do. They believe what they were told in textbooks. So you got an independent scientist, a guy that's thinking for himself, that says, hey, let's reproduce it. If it's scientists, let's look at it. For a long time, I studied virology from the beginning to the end and from the end to the beginning to be absolutely sure that there was no such thing as HIV. It, no such thing as HIV. And it was easy for me to be sure about this because I realized that a whole group of viruses to which HIV is said to belong, the retroviruses, as well as other viruses which are claimed to be very dangerous, do not in fact exist at all. How can he say that? Everybody's talking about this. How can they not do it? Okay, so. In December 2001, Lanka, in the case of influenza, herpes, vaccinia, polio, adeno, Ebola, each photo shows only a single part particle. Nobody claims that they're isolated particles, let alone particles that have been isolated from humans. In summary, it must be said that these photos are an attempt of fraud committed by researchers and medical scientists involved as far as they assert that these structures are viruses or even isolated viruses. To what extent the involved journalists and authors of text have contributed to this fraud knowingly or out of gross negligence, I don't know. Everyone who starts a researcher um, in the medical literature will quickly encounter statements referring to Koch's first postulates can't be fulfilled. Damn. So that means that there not only is an entire conspiracy, it's just fraud. So we look at this, and, as well as other viruses claim to be dangerous, but they don't exist. This is one of the proofs that he has. So when you look at this, these pictures over here, I've seen in my textbooks. Okay, they're showing me smallpox. They're showing me HIV. They're showing me chickenpox on the bottom. Okay, many of the photos are colored. This is proof that they are the artwork of the designers because electron microscopic photos always appear in black and white. The images of the so-called HIV smallpox clearly show that the image, um, these cells where viruses can allegedly be found. So they're showing cells and they're saying, yeah, sure enough, the viruses are inside. Okay, they're inside somewhere, but they can't see them, never been identified. Um, the photo shows actual cells types typical of endogenous particles in them. These structures are well known and they serve as intracellular transports. I mean, when you look at this, these are, are told to doctors that these are viruses actually existing. Nobody claims that they're isolated particles, let alone particles that have been isolated from humans. Etienne de Harvin, brilliant guy, another AIDS denialist, saying that HIV doesn't cause AIDS. Now, he wrote a book, The Ten Lies About AIDS. Um, instead of looking at a virus, he says, attributing the disease to lifestyle and environmental factors, a Bouchamp um, idea, that it's not the virus there that's causing it, it's the weakened immune system. Finally, um, electron microscope was used to verify the presence of the HIV virus. 
particles in samples that for 15 years were regarded as the pure virus. To my greatest dismay, these particles were shown um, practically nothing else but cell debris. They're presenting it and saying it. So let's look at this. Now, now granted, this is a real electron microscope vision. <laughs> okay, no, okay, it's an artist rendition. Okay, but let's look at this. Okay, so we know that 45% of your DNA is viral. We know that viruses um, are, are little bits of protein floating around that communicate to your DNA to help produce it. Now, this is an idea because since they've never identified those type of viruses, okay, that's an idea that it gets in there somehow. And we don't know how this works yet. Allergic diseases. So, our aim was to investigate the role of measles vaccination and measles infection to develop allergic disease in atopic sensitization. So, if you have this immune system response from a virus that's never been proven in court to even exist, that doesn't cause the infection, but you go through the whole process. Okay, you develop the fever, you develop the exudates, the little red dots, the, the whole thing that people call measles, okay, that you're protected um, from allergic diseases in children. Now, do we have an epidemic of allergic diseases in America now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't even open a bag of peanuts on a plane. Okay, frequent allergic diseases following the measles, it, um, uh, allergic in my pot. Viral and bacterial infections in childhood decrease the likelihood of allergic diseases later in life. The results of the study find that allergic diseases are less frequent in children with a history of measles. History of natural measles. Why? Because it's how your body and brain communicate to the outside world. Our retrospective studies show a significant uh, association between um, febrile infectious childhood diseases and the risk of developing cancer. The number of febrile infectious childhood diseases decreased the cancer risk in particularly for non-breast cancers. The relationship of the tumor site seems to be important, but can only be addressed by a larger study. It turns out that if you actually catch this stuff, it can reduce cancer. If you're actually catching the music, so then this is a, a, a viral particle that's not alive according to the experts. It's not alive. Okay, it's a well-organized molecular parasite that's transferring information to you and then giving your immune system a workout to protect you to our environment. So you get less, and since I infected um, the Lannans who were two blocks, two doors up, according to my sister, okay, I did, I did. Okay, but, but at the time I think it was only like five or six, I don't remember it. So my older sister, I mean, my younger older sister told me about this. <laughs> I'm forced to say that she's my younger sister. <laughs> it makes sense if you knew my family, okay? Okay, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, atopic diseases, hay fever, eczema, all of these things, cardiovascular diseases, all of these lessen if you have this communicating protein in your DNA that helps you adapt to the environment. Um, okay, abnormal measles, mumps, and rubella. So, you know, the vaccines, you're getting a false protein injected in there can damage the brain. Okay, now, immune system, how does it work? Look at the experts. Gary Fathom, professor of immunology and rheumatology. If a patient were to ask me, how's my immune system doing today? I would have no idea how to answer that. And I'm an immunologist, none of us can. We're messing with something. We're still going back to Beauchamp and Pasteur, and Beauchamp is now saying, is, is, is now more honored, because it's not just the pathogen, but I mean just common sense, for God's sake, okay? You don't do the same therapy to everyone, you don't have the same medicine for everyone, you don't have the same reaction. Why? Because we're individuals. It is the terrain. Everybody here has different physical, chemical, or emotional stressors. It's not the pathogen. It's not the pathogen. Chair Stanford at Davis. It's a lawful lot of moving parts. We don't know what the vast majority of them do or should be doing. These are the greatest immunologists on the planet. So what's cause? Genetics? Is your genetic just effective? You know, you're just going to develop these diseases? Okay, you're weakened? Or are you genetically designed to thrive on this planet? 
that you got to take care of your terrain. You take care of your terrain. You take care of your body. You'll live to the full 120. You don't need to have fear of bacteria, fear of yeast, fear of funguses, fear of your genetics. It's genetic, by the way. <laughs> then can you name five people that don't have it? Because this, I get this shit all the time. Oh, bunions run in my family, or bunions don't run. Okay, oh, inflammatory bowel disease again, you know, it's really bad. Okay, can you name anyone in your family that doesn't have it? You know, it, it's, just, it's just crazy. We're at a crossroads, and the crossroads are so great that your, your choices are being made for you. No longer do we have this open discussion between scientists. And when to next week, we're going to go more into the Pasteur Beauchamp at how there's, if you were against Pasteur, you were against God. Okay, I mean, really, really crazy stuff like it is today. So we have to understand that science is always changing, always evolving. It's, it, the end result is more beautiful than you could have possibly imagined. You're not being attacked. You're designed to live on this planet. You take these pathogens, and if you have healthy stress, healthy diet, nutrition, exercise, healthy social environments, you take care of your terrain, and I mean the mental, physical, and emotional terrain of your body, of your world, your world, you survive and thrive on this planet. It's time to change. The allopathetic model is done with 60% of our adult population having a chronic illness or disease, and the medical literature is saying, my God, it's not the disease, it's the terrain. 54% of our children have a chronic illness or disease. Is it the disease or is it the terrain? terrain. You betcha. Anyone that doesn't agree with me, I'll meet you in the parking lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, if you were working on these kids, wouldn't you want to fight for them too? Yeah. And I see it all the time. I mean, every day. Let's change this world. We're not going to change your terrain by giving you drugs. We're not going to terrain, change it in the positive. Health is a full expression of life. This means, is pain a, a, a clue to a problem? Or should we just take a Tylenol to get over it? You know, you drop a brick on your foot, it better friggin' hurt, okay? If not, you got syphilis or diabetes, okay? So pain is a real good thing for you. And when you look at these diseases, are these diseases, if these diseases can be affected in the positive, that's called reversing it by giving you fruits and vegetables. That means cancer, atherosclerosis, heart attacks, diabetes, all of these can help with some of the factors in these disease processes. It's not just eating vegetables and the cancer goes away, but it is one contributing factor. Why? Because the plants change the terrain. Okay, I'm going to meet wh whoever set this up. I'm going to meet them in the parking lot. Okay. Yeah, let there be light. Okay, yeah, it's the 1970s. Okay, so when we look at this, uh, <laughs> you know, ever have one of those health talks? <laughs> okay, no, I actually like the flickering. I always wanted a disco ball coming down here because you know I play music all day long. Okay, literally, healthy fats and oils. What does this do? Does this fight disease or change your terrain? Do we got to be afraid of the diseases or responsible for our terrain? Healthy plants, juiced vegetables, probiotics. I mean, we're talking 150 years ago. They were talking about the microzyma. We're just now understanding the gut-brain connection. We're understanding the beauty of bacteria on it. Okay, this is hugely important. When we put this up, how to treat diseases, Beauchamp would be, would be, a, Beauchamp would be 100% behind this. Why? Because this is affecting your design. It's affecting how you respond to the environment. Does that make sense? Okay, now we just got back from Puerto Vallarta, and I got to tell you, I'm going to put some pictures up, but it was an absolute blast. 
This one's coming up in April, and, and I just talked to Dr. O'Shea. It's going to be me and Dr. O'Shea teaching on it. There is going to be some continuing ed uh, credits. We're thinking it might be 8 to 12 hours. So that, the, that only matters because you're going to fly to Europe, okay, hang out in Greece, Crete, Israel, have a lifetime experience, and get credits for it. And that also means it's deductible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next week, we're going to expand on it better, and hopefully I'll have the video stuff fixed by next week. Thank you very much.